Welcome back to the program once again. If you're just joining us, this is Bottom Line Africa, right here on KTN News. Over to Uganda now, where today's session of parliament was again disrupted following scenes similar to yesterday's when lawmakers on opposite sides of the political divide brawled with each other. Chairs and punches were again thrown as chaos returned to the chamber and the speaker suspended the session. At least 25 members of parliament were suspended for three consecutive sittings following the scuffle. Some opposition MPs were seen wearing boxing gloves ahead of the session. And the MPs were to debate a motion to scrap the upper presidential edge limit. If removed, 73-year-old President Yoweri Kaguta Museveni will be eligible for a sixth term in office up until the year 20. 21. And now I'm joined by my colleague Nicholas, I mean Solomon Serowanja from Kampala, Shin Uganda. Shin Solomon, good evening. I'm sure uh, you have a lot to tell us. We're getting reports that the government of Uganda has banned live coverage of parliamentary proceedings. So what exactly happened today? Well, a very good evening to you, Yusuf. Uh, of course, it has been a very, very long day for the media here, especially after the Uganda Communications Commission banned any live coverage. No television station was accepted to relay all the events that happened in Parliament live, an issue that has caused a lot of outrage on social media, even though uh, clips, bits and pieces were shared on Twitter and on Facebook. By and large, it's been quite of a challenging day for the media here in Uganda, but I think um, it's very important for us to understand the context here. So uh, just to help us uh, bring all this uh, fist fight in Parliament today, uh, we have two guests on Bottom Line Africa. Andrew Mwenda joins us. Andrew Mwenda is the CEO of the Independent Magazine. He's also a celebrated journalist here, someone who has been in the industry for quite a while. He's also a political commentator, very known for his views, sharp views. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Nicholas Opio, human rights lawyer, but also political analyst, joining us in studio uh, this night. Thank you so much, Nick, for joining us. Thank you very much. Let's look at the conduct um, of, of members of parliament today. There was a lot of fisting here and there. Um, the speaker suspending 25 members of parliament uh, over misconduct. Yesterday, I saw her writing the names of the MPs who are misbehaving, and today, before she started uh, the session, she ordered them to be get out for three seats things and she ordered also the um, the, the security to throw to get them out uh, and this really caused a lot of havoc uh, just I'll start with you Nicholas what, what do you make of the conduct of members of parliament as you saw today I think that the members of parliament were engaged in unbecoming and parliamentary conduct and I think that the speaker was absolutely right uh, in suspending the members of parliament who were involved uh, in, in, you know, in those fights in Parliament today. So I think the Speaker was right. I also do think that uh, uh, the opposition members of Parliament, having realized that they were unable to in any way make a <coughs> very strong argument so as to convince uh, members of the NRM to join them in opposing the motion before Parliament, resorted to uncouth and an unethical conduct. And I think that it is really a shame uh, on, on the members of Parliament uh, it makes us all look shabby. And yet, yeah. in fact, it is just a few people who took to these sort of actions. Absolutely. So we'll be taking a look at those actions in just a while. We're trying to prepare the story so it will be there for you to have a clear understanding of what happened in Parliament and to understand uh, the debate tonight. Let me, let me turn to you, Andrew Mwenda. The conduct of members of Parliament, Nicholas, has described it as making us shabby. What are your views? I think that opposition members of Parliament recognize that when it comes to numbers, they don't have the numbers to stop the amendment of the constitution to remove edge limit. Remember, NRM, the ruling party, has over 361 members of parliament to amend the constitution out of uh, 436. So recognizing their weakness, they decided to maximize their nuisance value. And that is a demonstration of their desperation rather than of their hope. So I think that what we saw as violence was uh, one, an expression of desperation, but also two, an attempt to go down with the swan song in order to impress their electorate, which is where Hustle President Museveni and get reelected in the next election. 
All right, so um, for us to just um, understand and make our viewers know what really happened in Parliament today, we captured a story from our sister station, NBS Television, of what really happened in Parliament. So I'd ask us to, first of all, watch this story, and then we shall be returning with a fully-fledged debate on this issue. All right, so um, we will be relaying that shortly, but um, again... Fine. I, I've picked your thoughts um, on the conduct of members of parliament. Nicholas, do you blame members of parliament to act that way? Um, the fact that this was actually sparked off yesterday, the whole, today was perhaps the climax of it all, but it started yesterday when the speaker added uh, the motion of seeking leave of parliament to amend um, the constitution, Article 102B of the constitution, which of course puts a cap. Uh, at presidency, for anyone to stand for presidency uh, for se at 75 years. And it went out of hand after one member of parliament raised an issue of entering the chambers with a gun. Did the speaker act within, I mean, without, outside her powers? No. What the speaker did was within the ambits of the powers of the speaker uh, in the conduct of parliamentary proceedings. I think that no sane person no honorable member of parliament should have behaved the way the members of parliament behave, irrespective of what may have provoked them. Because there are other ways, civil ways, of behaving in parliament. But that said, I think it has to be mentioned as well that if a member of parliament from the government side did come into the chambers with a pistol as alleged, that is also an act we must all condemn. Because the parliamentary chamber is supposed to be a space for debates. It's supposed to be a a space where you walk in with your notebook and books, and, and, and not just guns. And I think that the conduct of that minister, of having entered in the chambers with a gun, is reprehensible. And I think that the speaker suspending that member, the speaker also did what I think is a commendable job. What I do think, though, uh, is, is, is objectionable is the presence in chambers of security operatives to enforce the orders of the speaker. Because the Parliament of Uganda has a whole parliamentary directorate with a commandant and the rank of an assistant inspector general of police. They have all the means within their reach to execute the orders of, of, of the speaker through the office of the sergeant at arms. Mm. So I do think that every side of this debate, in what we saw, the entry into parliamentary chambers with a gun, the storming of parliamentary chambers by uh, members of the special armed forces, the actions of opposition members of parliament is, is just all ugly. It, it's just unparliamentary, it's just reprehensible. What is but I think it represents mm. the nature of our politics and our politicians. Absolutely. That we do not, I don't think we are at a point where we value arguments for the sake of argument for what they are. Uh, they, they are devoid of any attempt to try and convince and persuade people, and, and so then they resort to all these kind of machinations. Well, because you see, the tyrant of numbers plays out in Parliament, so you'd expect that with members of Parliament vowing not to allow that motion to be tabled on the floor, then they had come up with several strategies to prevent it from even being read. Would you blame uh, the opposition members of Parliament for the actions that they took? Well, I think that um, it's not all opposition members of Parliament. There are 75 MPs in that House who do not agree with the attempted amendment, but they respect the procedure and the, the, the rules and procedures of the parliament. What has happened in Uganda is uh, that uh, the, mem the rebellious members of parliament are driven by social media, I think, and the desire for fame to act in a, an irrational manner as hooligans and therefore achieve cheap popularity on social media and in the public. Those MPs represent the people of their different yes, constituencies. But can I tell you, no one elected one single member of parliament to go there to be involved in a fist fight. They say they are fighting to defend democracy. Now, if you are a parliamentarian and you are fighting for democracy, the first thing you do is you respect the, democ the democratic procedures that are there. You see, democratic procedures can produce majorities or governments that are corrupt, short-sighted, incompetent, uh, irresponsible. That makes such governments undesirable. It doesn't make them undemocratic. You can see the democratic election of last year in the United States produced Donald Trump. A large number of Americans find him beneath the dignity of the office of the president. There was actually a protest. Yes. But they, res 
they accept him to rule. So you cannot simply say that because you do not agree with what the American population through the democratic institutions they have and provisions, the person they elected you will not respect him and therefore you as a minority because you think he's beneath the link to that office, you will not allow him to address Congress. You will not, I mean, do you get it? He may be an undesirable character. You must tolerate it because democracy does not always produce what you want. In the case of uh, Uganda, our democratic process, with all its imperfections, has produced a parliament that is heavily tilted in favor of the NRM. I think that, you see, the members of parliament are missing the fact that the battle they involved in is a political struggle. They are trying to use, you see, what is the aim of resistance to this uh, this amendment? Well, you know, because you don't have it the extends, numbers, so you no, need to the find cause, other The cause of resistance is not the amendment of the constitution to remove age limits. No. It is that doing so will m extend Museveni's stay in power. So this is a, a, a fight over whether Museveni should remain president or not. It's not about the age limit. It's about whether Museveni should remain president. Now, Museveni's stay in the presidency is a political struggle. And the only way you can stop Museveni cannot be through hiding behind legal and constitutional technicalities. Because you will be shared that. Exactly. So you need to go and mobilize the people. And I personally think that the members of parliament and every Ugandan activist and those who think that Museveni state is injurious to democracy, they need to go organize in their neighborhoods, in the office, in their places of work, in the schools where they study, in the markets where they sell I goods. Think, I think, I think I'm all right. in all fairness. Mm. Yes. Mm. The MPs tried to mobilize. There were rallies across the country for those who were opposed to the proposal. The government stopped all those rallies. So while allowing those who are for the amendments to freely demonstrate and express support, they were suppressing those who were opposed to the amendment. In fact, the Inspector General of Police came out and declared them an unlawful assemblies. So I think even the space for that discussion beyond Parliament has been restricted. The point has to be made that in a free democracy, all ideas must be, be able to flourish. To be. Yes, absolutely. Whether you agree with the ruling party or you don't. So the actions of the state agencies and state security agencies in blocking those who are opposed to this proposal from even consulting the people, from speaking to the electorate, it's itself wrong. And I think that, and that, that is exemplified by the attacks on NGOs who are perceived to be part of the campaign to oppose the proposed amendment. So I think that while Andrew is right, we must go and mobilize. The space for mobilizing in Uganda, as we've seen the, in, 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 in the last two months, has, has, has been severely constricted and tilted to favor those who agree with the proposal as opposed to those who oppose it. The, 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 from the, what I see, mm -hmm. the members of the opposition say they are fighting a dictatorship. I am inclined to agree with them. It follows, therefore, that the dictatorship will put in place obstacles and impediments in the way of the organization and mobilization of the population. It is part and parcel of the responsibility of those fighting dictatorship to make the necessary sacrifices to be able to mobilize in spite of those impediments. So to say that you're fighting a dictatorship and at the same time require that that dictatorship gives you democratic space to organize against it, is a contradiction in terms. Well, what, what, what I wanted, what, mean what that, that, that restriction is right in the first place. Gentlemen, what I also wanted us, I think, to really tackle on is this issue of amending at the Constitution. You would want to believe that for most of the, um, well, the, the gist of it is that all these MPs, opposition MPs and, and independent MPs are against, I mean, the core of their campaign is we will not allow that motion to be tabled. We will not allow it to even be debated because this is not what the country wants. That's according to them. And they say that we have the backing of the people, so we are here to represent the views and will not allow that. So let's talk about that. Um, Rafael Majizi's motion, well, constitutionally, he's right. He can be able to come up with a private member's bill. Article 94 of this Constitution of Uganda gives him that right. But it is the Constitution Amendments Bill. The Speaker, Rebecca Kadaga, came out clearly uh, in, in, after the infamous Sechitoleko uh, anticipated motion. She said, the Ministry for Constitutional Affairs and Justice should come up with an omnibus uh, constitutional bill that can be debated together so that, you know, they take the country forward. You have a cabinet supporting, which is actually responsible for drafting uh, bills to table before the House, backing an individual to come up with a private member's bill 
on the constitution. I, I want to start with you. What does this make of Uganda's cabinet? Lazy, or it's just that it's just falling on, Sorry, that's on what the whims of the see? executive? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I personally think that constitutions and constitutional provisions and parliamentary procedures and cabinet procedures are created and destroyed by political decisions. The political decision done by the cabinet and by the NRM caucus is to bring this amendment through a private member's bill. And I don't think there's any constitutional violation so far that has happened. What, what does, does that, that make the cabinet then? You see, On there are many ways, the there are different, you see, so I'm saying that these technicalities are not constitutional. NRM can decide to amend this constitution through a cabinet, a, a, a nominal bus, a nominal bus government constitutional uh, amendment bill, it can decide to get one of the provisions amended by a private member's bill. But I should also tell you, right, you see, part of the problem is we do not even know the full contents of this private member's bill because members of parliament would have been better to allow the member of parliament be given leave to go and present the bill before parliament. When, we, when they see what is in the bill, they should fight what is in the bill. Right now they are fighting the prospect such a, that such a bill, whose contents, in, to the extent we do not know, they, there could be 20 provisions he wants amended. That's what we want. Nicholas, do you agree with Andrew on no, this I issue? Think, I think I do differ because the motion for, for leave of parliament to table a private member's bill is accompanied by a draft bill. So the larger part of the bill is actually known. Uh, it's, it's nothing beyond the amendment of Article 102, uh, Clause B, to lift the age limit for one to contest for office from both the lower age limit but also the upper, upper age, age limit. Age. That is the content of the bill. That's, that's the crux of the bill. And the draft of that bill was, was attached to the motion. But the point that I wanted to make is this, that cabinet was instructed by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court directed cabinet to take before parliament proposals for amendment of the constitution. So in failing to do so, in fact the court asks that cabinet should update it after two years on progress on those proposals. But so in, in, in not, in failing to provide those amendments, or those proposals in parliament, I think in my view cabinet is really uh, uh, in contempt of the Supreme Court, because the Supreme Court directed that. Secondly, I think that no matter the method they choose to bring this amendment, what is important is that this country, popular debate, is that Uganda is ripe for a comprehensive review of our constitution. In fact, the Minister of Justice has proposed names to the President for the establishment of a constitutional review, review process. That commission, the names are with the president. It would have been decent. It would have been better if we went through a process of a comprehensive, other than a piecemeal review of our constitution. So I do think that the Ugandan cabinet mm. has abdicated from its duty and allowed members of parliament individually uh, to take up the mandate to bring you know, proposals. You know what you think? <laughs> These amendments are really political decisions. You are trying to constitutionalize and proceduralize politics. <laughs> politics doesn't work like that. Mm. Politics will work at what is most convenient for politicians, really. They and what is most convenient right now for the NRM is to see that their candidate comes uh, in 2021 after the amendment no, of that I, I, clause, Article 102B. My own thinking is that uh, Museven is not seeking to amend the constitution and remove age limits now, he may want to do it in 2019, mm -hmm. he's using this private member's bill to stimulate debate in the public. Make You see, when it is suggested right now, uh, about 70% of the population of Uganda, I saw an opinion poll by Afrobarometer, don't, like. don't want this amendment. Yes, absolutely. But Museven understands that the, the more it is discussed, debated, the more people come to resign themselves to it, the more it will look inevitable, and uh, therefore, over time, you will, you will see district councils voting to support the, the amendment. You will see LC3 councils at the level of the sub-county. As he builds support using this of... bill, then once he feels that the public has been sensitized more and is beginning to... Either men are becoming apathetic, seeing its inevitability, others are beginning to be bribed or convinced to join his bandwagon, 
then it will be tabled in Parliament. The, rather, it will be voted on. The actual voting of this bill may happen in 2019, 2020. It's not right. for now. Andrew Moinder, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. Yeah. Nicholas, it was a pleasure having you tonight. Always a pleasure. All right, we've been discussing the issues of the amendment, uh, possible amendment of Article 102B of the Constitution that, of course, lifts uh, the cap from uh, 75 to until, as long as you're ready to stand for presidency, you can be able to do that no matter the age. That's uh, a discussion that we're having in Uganda, but also we had some bloodshed in the corridors and indeed in the chambers of parliament after the scaffold that we had today, something that the gentlemen in studio have literally condemned. All right, now you're watching Bottom Line Africa. Let's go back to Yusuf for more of uh, tonight's stories. Yusuf. Thank you very much, uh, Solomon Saravanja from Kampala, Uganda, for that insightful debate. Of course, we're going to trust you with all the updates from Kampala, Uganda there. And now uh, let's cross over to our images of the day. And our images uh, come from South African artist and nothing can user who uses fire to create distinct work. By bringing his canvas so close to destruction, he creates vivid images that seem to carry an aura of mystery. Ever since Nkanyuza discovered he could play with fire to create art, it has become his favorite medium. Nkanyuza is a self-thought artist, having loved to draw since primary school. When he came across uh, Fumage, a technique made popular by Austrian artist Wolfgang Palin in the late 1930s, he says he knew it was the challenge he needed. A lot of, and I, I find out a lot of things online, but I, I got a lot of interest in smoke art, hence I decided to try it out and then since then, I've been doing it. My inspiration, like uh, in in art, like in doing art in general, it's the I would say it's the ability to create. But uh, my my artwork, the artworks that I uh, like I create every day, they mostly influenced by women or Africa and social issues and other social issues that we're faced with, and also it, depending on the emotions that I'm having at that time. Sometimes when I'm doing it like a, in front of a crowd, sometimes I, I just uh, get nervous and then I, I, I take the candle close to the canvas of which it just, uh, uh, the light just goes off. And finally, before we go to our bottom line editorial tonight, let's take a look at how our Twitter poll performed. And we did ask you earlier, do you think the protest by Ugandan opposition and peace of an age limit debate is justifiable? 86% of you said yes, and 14% of you said no. It means most of our viewers are in, agree in agreement with some of the opposition members of parliament and how they behaved yesterday. And finally, let's uh, cross over to a bottom line uh, tonight. And uh, fist fights and chair throwing broke out in Uganda's parliament a second day today ahead of a debate on whether to grant long serving President Yoweri Kaguta Museveni another fighting chance at the presidency. What we saw yesterday and today is nothing short of a scene straight out of an action packed movie as honorable members engage in an honorable behavior, exchanging blows, kicks, and some even use chairs to express their anger against fellow members. One may ask, does it have to degenerate to this? The sight of brawling, brawling politicians is totally out of touch with the norms of civilized parliamentary protocol. Such confrontational nature of politics reflects only one thing, the total disregard for the rule of law in a house where laws are made. Ironically, others see the move as an underhand attempt to extend President Museveni's rule. But again, let's call it as it is. The level of clampdown on the opposition by security forces only points to one thing. Uganda is turning into a police state. The executive in Uganda needs to know that East Africa is watching. Africa is watching and the whole world is also watching. The images that have become the public shame of the state known as the Pearl of Africa. And that's the bottom line tonight. My name is Yusuf Ibrahim. Many thanks for watching. Remember this program is aired every weeknight from Monday to Thursday from 10 to 11 p.m. See you tomorrow, same place, same time. Bye-bye and enjoy the rest of your night.